Now, when I hold up this book, what kind of response do you have in your heart? I've heard a few say amen and praise God. What about the rest? Well, let me give you some options that may be going on. Kevin DeYoung in his book, Taking God at His Word, mentions three possible responses to God's Word. And I think they're very accurate as I think of the people that I encounter. First one is, yeah, right. You know, in other words, we can't take these words too serious. They're way out of date. Those are the old times. We're living in the new times now. That's one response. Yeah, right. Another one is, ho-hum. Yeah, ho-hum. You know, intellectually, I, I believe this is God's word, but to be honest with you, practically, it's irrelevant to my life and it's boring. And then there's the third response that goes, yes, yes, yes. Because everything in this book rings true to your mind and resonates with your heart. I think that pretty much categorizes where most of us are at. Either we're yeah, right, or ho-hum, or yes, yes, yes. The Bible is a book we're going to talk about this morning because this is the foundation of why we do what we do here at Moraine Valley. And I want to help you understand why. Turn to Psalm 19 in your Bibles this morning. Psalm 19. That'll be our key passage. Uh, matter of fact, you say I'm newer to the Bible. How do, of course, I can't say this if you're on your phone, uh, but if you have the book, you open up in the middle, you're pretty close to Psalm. Uh, if you're on your phone, go to the index, push the buttons, and you'll get there. Go to Old Testament, Psalms 19, verse 7. That's what you want to do with your phone this morning. This is a passage that talks about God revealing himself through what they call two books, the book of nature and the book of his word, the Bible. And starting in verse 7, he talks particularly about his revelation through the Bible. As I read this, I want you to watch. I'm going to start in verse 7 and go through 11. I want you to watch for two things. What does he describe as the nature of God's word? And then what are the benefits that come from God's word? Watch as I read this, starting again in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They're more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. They're sweeter also than the honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned and in keeping them, there is great reward. The nature of God's word, it's perfect. That means it's without flaw, 100% flawless. It's sure, it says, the second part of verse 7. It's certain. It can be depended upon. It is sure. You can rest and bank and bet your whole life upon this word. It says it's right. You know what? We say what's right and what's wrong. You want to know what's right? God's word tells you what's right. It says it's pure. Zero contamination. 100% pure. It is clean. Not even a spot within God's word. It is true. That means what is real. What's reality? We always wonder, well, what is real here? What, what, what's going on? The word of God tells us what reality is. The nature of the words, God's word is it's righteous. That means it's honorable. And it endures forever. That means it always has been, it is, and always will be perfect and sure and right and pure and clean and true and honorable. 
Matter of fact, it's even more desirable than gold because it can give us things that money can't buy and it's sweeter to our souls than honey is to our body. And then when you see the benefits, as it restores our souls. It has a restoring effect. Celebrate recovery. We get in front of God's word. We come in with our habits, our hurts, and our hang-ups. We get in front of God's word. We pray. We seek God. And there's something that happens that begins to restore our soul. It makes wise the simple. Man, I love the benefits of God's word because I need restoration. I need God's wisdom. It says it rejoices the heart. You get done reading this book and your heart is singing. Rejoices the heart. It enlightens the eyes. I don't know what to do, God. And I come into this book and I'm reading it and all of a sudden I'm beginning to see and understand. Lights are coming on inside of my head and my heart as it enlightens my eyes. God's word is of tremendous value. We can go on and on. You know, this passage, we go to Psalm 119, which is just the longest chapter in the whole Bible. We can go throughout the Bible and it talks over and over and over again about the many benefits of God's Word. But I want to just show you one other important part of God's Word here in Psalm 19. We have enough reasons already looking at it to drink deeply from this book and to build my life around it and make sure that it's becoming the center of my experience is one of the pillars of my life. But there's one more reason given in verse, uh, I'm sorry, in Psalm 19. Look at verse 7. See if you can pick it up as I read it. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are true. This is, this is the point. We, we somehow, it's kind of like this morning, and I'm glad we didn't have them up there. Sometimes we see the words and we just we don't even re register. We're just singing. We're singing words. I'm concerned that when we read the Bible, we have the same experience. We're reading the words. We forget these are the words of the Lord. Six times in this passage, that's, that's for emphasis. These are God's words. These are important and it's important for us to come to this book and to drink deeply of it because the source of the words are God. These words belong to God. They're connected with God. And the reason why it's so important for me to come and read this book daily, to pray over it, to memorize, to meditate, and most importantly obey it, is because there are God's words. You ever wonder, I wonder what God thinks about this. You want to know what God thinks about it? This is where we find out. Because this is where God has recorded his words, his thoughts, his desires. Do we have the PowerPoint verses or not? I don't know if we have. Uh, do we have First Thessalonians? Yes. Thanks for getting this transferred over. Thessalonians, Paul is writing, for this reason we all... Also, constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God. You see that? <laughs> and so many times, we just, you know, this isn't like the newspaper. This isn't like the best sellers on New York Times list. This is like no other book in the world. And when we read it, we can't just read it like another book, and we can't respond to it just like another book and add it to the collection of other books. This is not the word of men. This, what it really is, it's the word of God. And then I love it, which also performs its work in you who believe. First Peter 4 says this, Whoever speaks, that's me this morning, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of of God. Now what Pat has to say are not the utterances of God. 
what the Word of God has to say, and when Pat reinforces what God's Word says with his words, he's speaking the utterances of God. And he wants us to understand these aren't just words of another man. These words in here are the very words of God. And when you lead a Bible study, when you lead a pathway class, when you're preaching a sermon, whenever you're teaching somebody else, you need to speak and help them understand these are the words of God. I love what uh, Charles Stanley said with raising his kids. I tried this. I when your children are struggling with something, he says, don't give them your opinion. Read the Bible to them. Show them what God's word says because you know what? Now they realize their issue isn't with mom and dad. Their issue is with God. And when the Holy Spirit puts his sense upon this word that this is, these are God's words, and when you're dealing with another person who's struggling with sin or any, any encouragement you want to bring, you want to remind them, it isn't my best words that help people. It's God's words that help people. And what we want to do is help people see that these words have come from God. So I just want to apply this in one way this morning. And it's simply this. If these words have come from God, and the words in this book are the very words of God, then we need to realize that this book holds authority over our life. That means this. It has the right to call the shots in my life. It has the right to have the final word in my life. It has the right to tell me what to do and what not to do and how to do it. Because these words come from God. Now, if you forget everything else I say this morning, try, may God give us grace to write this one on our heart, and that's this. These words hold authority over our lives because of whose book it is. You follow me? It's not just a book by itself. But the reality is, is this supernatural holy book, holy means one of a kind, none other like it. These words hold authority over my life because the one who has all authority in heaven and earth <laughs> is the one who recorded his book, his words in these books. You follow me? So this has authority over my life because of whose book it is, because of whose words they are. These are the words of the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And because these are his words, these words have the right to have the final word in my life and call the shots for my life. Because God is God. Because he's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He has the right and the last word to tell me what to do with my money, who I date, who I marry, how I handle my thought life, my attitudes, my sexuality, what I say, how I spend my time, even how much I eat. And I'm going to stop there because it's getting a little bit too convicting for me. But the reality is, is God really does have the final word in my life. He has the right to because of who he is. And he's communicated his desires, his heart, his mind, his plan, his purposes, his agendas. Everything, his will, God has revealed to us in these words words and we have a high respect for this book above any other book above any other voice above any other media of bringing opinions over any other thoughts because it came from God it reveals who he is and what he wants and who we are and what is real look at how highly God respects his own word this is God's this is God's attitude towards his word okay I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you, God, have magnified your word according to all your name. Did you catch that? 
God has lifted up his word and put it on par with his name. What kind of respect should we have for God's word? What this is telling me is that God has such high respect in honor. Scripture says he watches over to fulfill his own word. That God has elevated and magnified and lifted up his word and he's put it on a level with his own name, with his own character, with who he is. God has a high view of his word. And we need to. Let me try to say it like this. I think because God has elevated these words on par with him and because they're his words to disrespect this book is to disrespect God. To ignore this book is to ignore God. To take what these words say lightly is to take God lightly. To disobey these words are to disobey God. That's simply the reality of this book. God has put it on par with his own name. They're his very words. They're the expression of his heart and his plan. And if you just say, hey, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't care what it says. That's out of date. That's old-fashioned. Ho-hum, that's irrelevant. That's boring. You know what, guys? That's what we're saying to God. This book is of great, great, high value because of whose words they are. And so my point, as I said earlier on, at Moraine, we try to build our life and our ministry. I'm not saying we do it perfectly, and I'm not saying we're the only church that does. I'm just telling you who we are and how we try to operate. There's, God has many of his churches out there seeking to walk with him and obey his word. There's some that certainly aren't. That's a whole other story, but what we value here at Moraine is what does God say? And so my question for you this morning is this. Who has the final word in your life? Who's calling the shots? Who's making the decisions? Who's determining the activities? Who's defining your relationships and putting the boundaries upon them? Who's informing your worldviews? What about your thoughts, your words, your entertainment, your schedule, your agendas, your life purposes? Who is making the final decision on those things? Is it God as he expresses himself through his word? Or is it something or someone or maybe even yourself that are making those decisions? Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Jesus, you're my Lord, I love you, I worship you. And then what Jesus would say, well, why are you calling me Lord? Why are you sitting here down here worship me today like this? And yet, when I tell you to do this, you don't do it. See, when I think of this, when I think about Jesus as my Savior, I think of the cross of Christ, and I think of faith and dependence upon what Jesus did for me on the cross. But when I think of Jesus as my Lord, I think about his word. And my obedience to his word and the way that I respond to his word. And so Jesus is saying to you and to me this morning, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and you're not even doing what I tell you to do? You know, this is a battle point that Satan, this is big. This, this, this scripture shows this many times over. But you know, this is a battle point that is fueled by Satan. It's fueled in our culture. It's fueled in our churches. It's fueled in our personal lives. Remember all the way back to the garden? God has spoken his word to Adam and uh, what they were to do in the garden and not do. And what did Satan do? He came and he got them confused about what God says and got them to question God and his word 
got them all off-centered so that no longer was their decisions based upon what the God of the universe has said to my life, but now their decision was based upon what was pleasurable to them, what was a delight to them, what was desirable to them. See, Satan throws us off-center because if our relationship with God is based out of this book and how he wants us to live. Satan wants to constantly keep us off center there. He's going to do everything he can to get us not even to go into God's word to know what he says, when we're in it to confuse us with it, get us to disbelieve, whatever would be the case, and to get us to move our decisions away from being based on what God says through his word to that which pleases me. This is what I want. This is what's desirable to me. This is what delights my eyes. You following me? This is what Satan does to you and me. What about in the wilderness with Jesus? Same issue. He tried to get Jesus to disobey God by what God said in his word. And when Satan came and tempted Jesus, Jesus always responded with God's word and submitted to what God had to say. And remember what Satan tried to do? He tried to get Jesus to make responses based upon his bodily needs. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. He's hungry. And so he tried to tempt him to feed himself outside of the will of God. So he used his bodily desires to try to get him to decide by there. He offered him all the kingdoms of the world, all the possessions a person can have. Puts right in front of his eyes, say, here you go, Jesus, these can be yours. Then he even says about all the fame, the glory of all this will be yours. You see, Satan is working with you and me today the same way. Rather than making decisions based on this book, he wants us to make decisions based upon our bodily needs. He wants us to make decisions based upon the possessions that we can build and attain to our lives and live our life to get more and more possessions or the fame and the position. This is all that's in the world. You know, the... the the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, the the, uh, lust of the eyes, the things we see that we want, those are the possessions. Boastful pride of life, getting myself a little bit bigger in the eyes of myself and other people. Lust of the flesh, the desires of my body. Satan is constantly working with me and you to somehow get us (laughs) off-centered. from looking at God's word and what God says to make our decisions based on something else. So this is what I want to encourage you to do this week. I think on the back of your flyers, you should have flyers. I just wrote this down, some things. I'd encourage you to take some time this week to prayerfully consider before the Holy Spirit. Take one of your quiet times. Say, God, you know what? I want your spirit to search me and try me. See if there's any hurtful way in me. And ask yourself the question, who's calling the final shots in my life? Is it your political bent? Is it political correctness? Is it the North American culture? Is it Hollywood? Is it the community that we live in, our local culture? Is it the group I hang with, my peers? Is it the opinion polls and what everybody else says? Maybe it's my own personal opinion poll. I ask my friends what they think. Maybe it's everybody's doing it, so why shouldn't I do it? Maybe it's the way I grew up. Maybe it's the way my parents did things. Maybe it's Dr. Phil. Maybe it's some person I care for deeply or somebody I respect deeply. Maybe it's traditions. This is the way we've always done it. Maybe it's human reason. Well, I've got, I got to be able to logically figure this out and critically think about it and sort out every possible solution that could happen. Maybe it's our past experiences. Maybe it's my personal desires. Maybe it's my needs. Maybe it's the feelings that I have or the impressions I'm getting upon my heart. Maybe it's what pleasures me. Maybe it's my personal goals. Maybe it's just me and what I want. Or are the final shots in your life being called by the Word of God? 
This is an important exercise to do this week. Who's calling the shots in your life? Who has the final word about everything in your life and mine? It's gigantic. Satan will do everything he can to keep you from this exercise. Satan will do everything he can to keep you from submitting your life to God and recognizing that these words are really God's words and to get us to live on some other authority. And then finally, I want to close with this. I term this message, and I ask to encourage you, if you can come out this month, why do we do what we do here at Moraine? You know, at Moraine Valley, we don't make final decisions about policy and practice and faith based upon the traditions of churches in the past or even the traditions of Moraine Valley Church. It's the way Moraine's always done it kind of thing. That isn't the way we make decisions. It's not based upon how other churches do it. We look out the community and see other churches and say, well, they're successful, how do they do it? So we, we don't base decisions based upon that. We don't even find a book that a successful pastor wrote and said, this is what you got to do to be successful. We don't look at the way that things used to be at Moraine. We don't look at the way things are always done. You know, sometimes other people call it, that's Moraine's way. You know, God's way is more important than Moraine's way. Moraine's way has to be sanctified sometimes. And so we don't even look at how did we used to do it and how have we always done it. We don't even look at the opinion polls of the lost community around us and say, what do they want in church and form church built upon what the lost people say they want. And you know what? We don't even do opinion polls of the believers in the seats and ask what they want. Because, guys, it isn't about what I want, what you want, what the believer wants, the lost wants. It's what God wants. So we've got to go to God's book and see what he wants. We don't build and shape Moraine Valley upon the corporate world and say, well, this is how corporations do it and how they become successful, so we're going to become like a corporation and do it like them. That's not how we make decisions at Moraine. We don't even look at the best practices in the, in the business world or even from other churches and say, we must do it this way because obviously they have success like that. And here's one that shocking to me obviously the board learned this lesson a long time ago it's taken me longer to learn this we don't even make decisions based on what the senior pastor wants <laughs> what his opinions and preferences are we seek to make every decision based upon the word of God and what does God want now that doesn't say we can't learn from others don't misunderstand me I'm not saying that nothing else is of value. We can learn things, but we can't base our final word and decision upon anything except for what God says he wants on how he wants his people to operate, how he wants his church to operate, both on Sunday morning as well as Monday through Saturday because the church is a week-long event. It's not just a Sunday morning event. We let God define what the church is, not our culture, not our past practices. You follow me? The important thing we have to say and we're constantly doing as a board is saying, what does God want? Our heart is to be like the Bereans in Acts 17. We have a class here, Pastor Clem. The Bereans, they take Pat's sermons and they go in there and say, is this really what God said? Search it out. Now the Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great... Man, give me the word. Here's Paul preached to them. This is Paul the apostle. Paul, keep it on. Don't worry about the clock. Keep bringing it on. We're excited to hear the word of God. Bring it on. We're eager. But when they got done, guess what they did? They went back and they examined the scriptures to see whether these things were so. It's even Paul. I don't know who the modern-day equivalent of Paul is, but whoever that is, in this day and age, we say, obviously, this guy is the best preacher, and he really knows his stuff. The point is, even then, we've got to take it back and say, is that what God said? So my point is simply this. I want to encourage you. We as a church try to operate this way perfectly. 
No. But this is where we're seeking. This is what we're trying to be and where we're constantly trying to go. I want to encourage you in your life. You don't have to be perfect now, but begin to move the direction of your life to say, God, I can't base any decision in my life, any direction in my life, except for what you have expressed in your word because this book has authority because it's your book, it's your words, it's your opinions, it's your thoughts because you are the God who has all authority in heaven and on earth. May God give us grace as believers individually and as a church that everything we do, we do in submission to God as expressed in his word. So Jesus won't have to look at Moraine and say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? As the worship team comes up to close us, I just want to encourage you, come on back next week, because God's word is spoken. Why do we exist as a church? Now you know how we make decisions around here. Now you know we, why we do what we do. It informs so many things. That touch. It's why I preach the way I preach. I, I could do a whole sermon on that someday, but the point is, is that why we do things the way we do is because we're trying to understand what God says in his word and do it the way he has called us to do it. And next week I'm going to come back and talk about what has God said, why do we exist? Why do you exist personally? Why do we exist as a church? Why do we together as a corporate group of people who live life together as believers in Jesus, why has God placed us on this earth, at this place, in this time, and brought you to Moraine Valley? Next week, come on back. I want to share that with you. Father, I just pray. Lord, as I said, I, there, there, there's not a bone of arrogance in me that says we're the ones who are doing it right are the only ones. Lord, I want to pray for all your churches. Lord, as we seek to understand your word, we seek to honor you as we honor your word. We pray, God, that you would help us learn from the things you put out there for us to learn from. But Lord, you help us discern what your final word is on the issues we face. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would build in us a value of your word that's as high as you have built. God, you have magnified it with all your name. God, would we, would we honor your holy word deeply? And God, would you give us the grace by your spirit to obey it? Give us the enlightenment by your spirit to understand it. I just pray in Jesus' name.